We're now 70 years embedded in assuming the use of military power is the form of American exceptionalism and leadership. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we are talking with Gordon Adams. He's an emeritus professor of international studies from American University. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me. Let's talk a bit about um, the Overseas Contingency Operation Budget. Um, talk a little bit about where that comes from, particularly in a 21st century context. President George W. Bush, when he first invaded Iraq, uh, realized that the Department of Defense's existing budget was not going to be adequate to fund a force of 250,000 people in Iraq and whatever residual, about 30,000 I think we had at the time in Afghanistan. And so they came up with a supplemental budget. Now that's not unusual. Right. In other war times, first year or two, we always go up and say, well, we didn't know we were going to do it and we need some extra money and we didn't count on it and Congress help us out. Normal. Normal budgetary behavior. In Vietnam, in Korea, in any other instance where we've done this, after two years, you sort of say to the Pentagon, okay, we're operating there. This is business as usual now. You just got to build into your planning what it costs to conduct this military operation. Right? Bush changed the precedent. He didn't do that. He kept coming in with a supplemental budget. And the nice thing about doing that was you could put it into the hopper any time during the year, not when the budget had to go up for the regular base budget of the Pentagon. And you knew that you didn't have to scrub it as much either in the Pentagon or at OMB in the White House or on Capitol Hill because it was urgent, it was important, it was the troops in the field, you had to do it, right? So the, we got used, the Pentagon got used to this two, twofold binary budget process mm -hmm. where they plan all the so usual stuff. So they have their stuff, base defense right? budget, which covers all the, the people yeah. and the long-term acquisition of equipment and the overhead, which is huge, 42% right. of the Pentagon budget's overhead, right? No private business would ever accept that ratio, but that's what we do. And then, oh, and here's the extra. Here, here's the stuff for the warfighter. Well now, you know, Pentagon civil servants and admirals and generals are no more stupid than anybody else. They figured out over time that this was great. If you could go in with something called an extra budget for the troops, and you couldn't get some of the stuff you wanted in the regular budget, well, let's put it in the extra budget for the troops. So the OCO budget, the Overseas Contingency Operations budget, is supposed to deal with, okay, it's going directly to right. people in the field, you know, on the battle lines in Iraq. It's for fighting the war. What, right. what else was going into that that had nothing to do with? All budget? kinds of things. Right? Such as? Well, such as, for example, back in the early 20th century, the Army had decided quite separate from war that it wanted to restructure from divisions to brigades. And armies always had divisions. And the army was saying, well, we need to move smaller groups of people. So we need uh, you know, an autonomous, operable brigade structure for the army. And so they migrated to that brigade construct. All the costs of migrating were put in the OCO budget, which was then the supplemental, rather than in the base budget, although this was a base operation. The army, this is particularly an army problem, the army bought a lot more striker vehicles than they had planned to buy because they could put a bunch of them in the overseas contingency operation budget. They took the entire tank inventory of M1A2 tanks and converted them to a modern version in the overseas contingency operation budget. In other words, they were putting in constantly right. things that belonged in base planning for the Pentagon into this extra money ostensibly for the forces and in the field. you've characterized this as a slush fund. Totally. Yeah. So what happened recently, I mean, you know, we're, we're out of Iraq. We're supposed to right. already be out of Afghanistan, but we will eventually. So there should be a total drawdown of the OCO, right? And, there, and financially, there was. The, the Overseas Contingency Operation Account, which was the name the Obama administration gave to it, you know, post-supplementals, that OCO account was as high as $187 billion one year for when we were at the height of the Iraq surge. It's now in the 50 to $60 billion range. Right? So it did come down. But because we have pulled virtually everybody out of Afghanistan and Iraq, mm -hmm. there's no way we're spending 50 to $60 billion on and operations. 50 to $60 billion, dollars, just to put that in perspective, that's basically the State Department's complete budget. The entire foreign policy budget of the United States, state, AID, all the trade agencies, et cetera, is about $52 billion. So that one OCO budget for the military, which is a little less than 10% of their whole budget, is in fact as big as all of our foreign policy investment. What is the effect of having a kind of standing slush fund on top of regular defense budget? 
Well, it what, what effect does that have? It on completely this? destroys budget discipline. I mean, mm -hmm. the bottom line here, for, you know, I'll put my, my beanie on for mm -hmm. a moment. The, from a budgeteer's point of view, saying there's always more money simply conveys the message to the department, you don't have to make choices. You can always find a way to raise the money for the things that you want to do. Right? We saw this previously at the beginning of the Reagan administration because over a two-year period, Reagan added over $50 billion to the defense budget, the regular defense budget. People in the Pentagon were reaching in desk drawers and pulling out dusted projects right. that they hadn't gotten funded and said, oh boy, we've got to spend $52 billion more dollars. What do we do? That's the kind of thing that happens today. There's no discipline, so and no choices is, get made. This is despite the uh, specter a couple years ago of sequestration, which went into effect because neither Republicans or Democrats could come up with a budget. Um, that didn't right. really put a crimp in Pentagon Frankly, plans. Frankly, all of the Congressional Budget Office and Gener Government Accountability Office research since that happened in 2013 has shown the Pentagon sailed through it mighty well. What's the likelihood that you know this time in a year that we will see an overseas contingency operation budget that's been drawn down to reflect our diminished uh, set of wars overseas? I think the prospect is zero. Mm -hmm. I worked in the OMB transition team in 2009. We wrote a deal before Obama took office with the Pentagon to limit the things that could be covered in the OCO mm -hmm. account. So it'd be very strictly defined. If you lost equipment in Iraq, you could replace that piece of equipment. If you had this much additional in salaries you had to pay because of hazardous duty pay or combat pay, those could go in the OCO budget. Nothing else, everything else had to be in the base. OMB has tried since 2010 budget to phase out OCO. We're about to go forward with the 2017. So that's eight budgets later. We still have a $60 billion OCO account or budget. It's not really an account, it's a budget at the Pentagon. And the comptroller of the Pentagon said last month that it was pretty clear they were going to leave office without having abolished the OCO account and migrated it to the base. Is there any chance, I mean, people like Rand Paul in the Republican Party and Bernie Sanders have talked about applying an audit process to the Department of Defense. Is that worth doing? Is it likely to shed light in a way that would actually reform defense spending? A lot of people argue very vigorously for auditing in the Pentagon, and indeed the Pentagon is supposed to meet federal financial accounting standards by 2017. That's the latest promise by the Obama administration is to make it by then. That was Leon Panetta who set that goal when he was Secretary of Defense. They won't make it. Uh, it's a huge complex organism that does more than 20 million contracting actions a year, has over 2 million people between active and reserves in the military, 800,000 people, civilians working for it, and 700,000 contractor, individual contractor service personnel working for it. This is a massive organism. All the audit is really going to tell you is when the Congress appropriated X dollars for X purpose, did it actually get spent on X purpose? Mm -hmm. Right? And that's useful knowledge. It's not going to reform the way the Pentagon does business. So what, if anything, can be done uh, to you know, reform the Pentagon culture about spend it and, it, and the dollars will flow? Uh, and then also, how do we pull, if foreign policy should lead and defense, defense policies should follow, right. what has to happen for that to be kind of reversed? Well, as, uh, on the first question, you know, how do we reform the Pentagon and its practices? It's tremendously hard, and the one thing that matters most, there's two things really that matter most. One is cut their budget, because nothing focuses the attention of a teenager better than losing their allowance. So budget cuts lead to reform. They have in the past, they will in the future. And two, leadership in the building itself at the very top, persistent, devoted, leadership to the issue of controlling the way the money gets spent because they have to cut the overhead. We can have a smaller force and still do what we need to do militarily. They have to control the cost of hardware programs. They got runaway pension and health care costs. They got all these things that aren't being managed and when you've got too much money you don't have to manage them. So solving the reform problem means cutting the budget and having leadership that's committed to cutting the budget. Right, which is why the kinds of things that Paul says or that Sanders said make a lot of sense, because it's a way of imposing discipline. How you change this bigger cultural relationship between force and foreign policy is very, very tough, because we're now 70 years embedded 
in assuming the use of military power is the form of American exceptionalism and leadership internationally. And breaking that connection and saying our leadership really depends on our economic strength, on our cultural strength, on our diplomacy, and on the capacity to call upon the military in service of our goals when you need it. We're going to have to start thinking differently from the way we thought for 70 years. That's a real uphill battle. We've been talking to Gordon Adams. He's an emeritus professor from American University. Thanks so much for speaking with us. Pleasure. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.